welcome to the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum. I'm Gerald Shively, Associate Dean and Director of International Programs in the College of Agriculture at Purdue University, your host for this year-long series of events. On behalf of the organizing committee, our advisory group, and everyone contributing to this effort, I'd like to welcome you. I'd also like to take this moment to thank USDA, in particular the Foreign Agricultural Service, for its support of the forum. For today, we're pleased to bring to the virtual stage a series of presentations that have been thoughtfully organized by our colleagues at Crop Life International. I'd like to thank them for their efforts, in particular those of Dr. John McMurdy, Director of Emerging Markets and Development Partnerships. Today's session focuses on biological amendments and is chaired by Terry Stone, Global Regulatory Leader at Corteva AgriScience. This session serves as a direct complement to prior sessions on genetic improvements in crops and livestock. Recordings of those sessions are now available on the forum website. I encourage you to check them out and share the links with your colleagues. Please enjoy the program, everyone, and please stay for the live question and answer session that will follow the presentations. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My, my name is John McMurdy. I'm the Vice President for Innovation and Development at uh, CropLife International. So I wanted to start uh, and welcome you to this session, uh, one that we have uh, co-organized with, uh, with Purdue University, and, and I think it will be a, an enjoyable, enjoyable session for us. Uh, so CropLife International, uh, if, if you're unfamiliar, we are an industry association representing uh, the plant science industry across technologies and innovations. Uh, we work at the international level, but we work with a global network of associations in, in more than 80 countries. So as, as, as CropLife International, we're certainly appreciative of uh, being given the opportunity to both uh, participate in this session and participate in this year-long global forum on agricultural innovation. Uh, the last uh, five to six uh, sessions, uh, I believe, have been a, a great showcase for influential presenters, uh, really hitting a lot of the key topics that we're, that we're all interested in. I think uh, with, with a lot of the competing interests and noise out there, uh, it's really as important as ever that we keep innovation at the center of this discussion about agriculture and sustainability. And this has been a great venue to, to do so and will continue to be a great venue. So today's session uh, focuses on, on one slice of that innovation in biologicals and how these innovations can sustainably maintain and, and boost productivity. So I, uh, I look forward to the, to the presentations uh, as they follow afterwards. Uh, last, I wanna give uh, certainly specific thanks to Terry Stone of Corteva AgriScience, uh, who will be our, our moderator today and is, has really done most of the work in organizing this session. So special thanks to, to Terry today. So thank you all, enjoy the session. Thanks a lot, John, and good morning, good afternoon, and probably good evening. We have a wonderful session today ahead of us, and uh, from what I understand, there's quite an extensive number of people who have signed up, so thank you for taking the time to do so. I'd like to personally thank uh, USDA, FAS, and Purdue University, and of course the Global Ag Innovation Forum for the opportunity to moderate the panel of experts on genetic innovations and biological amendments. Our first speaker is Ms. Jane Kamau. And Jane is the commercialization and agribusiness manager for AFLASAFE at the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture. She has worked with Kemonix <laughs> International, the Netherlands Development Organization, Eastern African Grain Council and East Africa Breweries Limited. Her work focuses on unlocking private and public resources for scaling out agricultural innovations that positively impact lives. Jane's talk is entitled Genetic Innovations to Improve Food Safety and Toxin Control. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jane Wanzakamau from the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, IITA. And I'm making this presentation on behalf of the AFLASAFE team. And the topic for my presentation will be on genetic innovations to improve food safety and toxin control. 
So we are looking at genetic innovations in food safety and toxin control. The toxin of focus is aflatoxin. And aflatoxin is a poisonous compound produced by a fungi known as aspergillus. And um, aspergillus is naturally found in the soil. And it contaminates crops, mainly staple food crops, maize, groundnuts, and sorghum as they grow in the field. So aflatoxin is a problem that originates from the field, but often exhibited in storage. And hence why it's thought of as an, a post-harvest uh, challenge. How then do we as humans get contaminated by aflatoxins? It's through consumption of aflatoxin contaminated grain, maize, groundnuts, or sorghum. So if you directly consume contaminated grain, and contaminated grain is grain with above uh, the allowable levels, 10 parts per billion for this part of Africa. If you directly consume these grains, then you, the toxin enters your body. And this happens over time, chronic exposure. But where the level of aflatoxin is very high in the grain, we have seen people die, actually livestock die because of acute poisoning because of their aflatoxin. If the contaminated grain is fed on livestock, chicken or pigs, the, the aflatoxin then contaminates the byproducts, the meat, the eggs and the milk, and by consuming them, then we get aflatoxin contamination. And likewise for children, if we feed them on contaminated food, then they get contaminated. The impacts of aflatoxin contamination have been, have been really, really significant. And uh, the Partnership for Aflatoxin Control in Africa, PACA, has attempted to quantify this impact. In, in one of their past studies, it's clear now that 30% of the liver cancers in Africa are attributable to aflatoxin contamination. Over $100 million are lost in trade because contaminated grain cannot be traded. It doesn't meet the required standards. And in terms of food security, in African markets, over 40% of the commodities traded in African markets have been found to have aflatoxin levels that exceed the allowable levels. So that clearly explains the continued, continued exposure to aflatoxin through the foods that we consume. Different governments across Africa have really begun addressing the issue of aflatoxin. And if I may quote a very recent case, it's in Kenya banning the importation of maize from Uganda and Tanzania because of aflatoxin. That clearly shows an impact on trade. As a result, then aflatoxin management has become a key issue for governments, for us in research, and for consumers as well. And so there are multiple methods of dealing with aflatoxin. However, none of these methods can exhaustively solve the problem. They need to be used in com combination. Biocontrol, which is where we have genetic innovation, is one of the simple ways to deal with aflatoxin, and I'll be illustrated in the subsequent uh, presentation. So, since aspergillus is found in the soil, crops get contaminated with their grain in the field. IITA has adopted and improved on a technology that was initially developed by the United States Department of Agriculture, the Agricultural Research Service. And this process entails isolating the aspergillus from the farm, from the soil, and then um, distinguishing them based on the ability to produce or not produce toxins, and then selecting those that do not produce toxins and using them to, to make the product aflacif, 
that goes back and is applied into the field and significantly reduces contamination for crops. I shall explain in a little detail. So this is as simple as it looks. It's a very elaborate process that takes between four to five years in the different countries. And the essence of this process is to distinguish which of the Aspergilla species is producing aflatoxin and which is not, and the reason for not producing the aflatoxin. And the reason for not producing the aflatoxin has been greatly attributed to their genetic makeup. This, on this slide, we hereby illustrate the difference between the toxigenic, those that produce aflatoxin, and the atoxigenic strains. As you can see, the atoxigenic strains have had one defect or another. Either they have missing genes or chromosomes or defective ones or totally different genetic makeup from the toxigenic. And so through especially molecular studies, we are able to isolate in any given uh, sample toxigenic strains, those that produce uh, toxins and those that do not produce toxins. And those that do not produce toxins is what we select from which we select the most um, competitive, the most stable, and uh, the ones that are widely distributed to produce the product that is known as Aflasafe. So far, there are about 17 products that have been commercially registered, used, uh, originated from this uh, technology. And um, 14 of those have been registered to IITA across 12 countries. But like I said earlier, we adopted this technology from the US. And so two of those products are registered in the US and one in Italy. So if I may go back just to how we then make up Aflasif, the solution, the biocontrol solution we are talking about, is that using the four most competitive, widely distributed strains that we isolated, we make a spore suspension, coat it onto sterilized sorghum, coat it with a polymer and a dye to differentiate it from food source. And that gives you Aflasif. So actually Aflasif is 99% sorghum, and the active ingredient is the spore suspension made up of the four non-toxin producing aspergillus that have been isolated in a given area. So once Aflasif is produced, a farmer just needs to broadcast it on the farm two to three weeks before flowering. The rate of application is four kgs per acre or 10 kgs per hectare. And as soon as the spores come into contact with the ground and there's moisture, the spores grow. And it is these spores that provide the protection for the crop. Basically, this is competitive exclusion because what, has, what is happening here is that by applying Aflasif, you have increased the significant number of atoxigenic aspergillus and thereby displacing the toxin producing aspergillus. We continuously carry out efficacy trials across the different countries. And from our efficacy trials, here is a case of Ghana. We have clearly seen and proven that Af Aflasif is able to reduce aflatoxin contamination between 96 to 100% with just a single application. In summary, this technology where the genetic makeup of aspergillus has been used to produce a product that controls toxins, IIT and partners have been working on scaling it out in Africa. So we have Aflasif available in 14 countries. And we have also been able to mobilize private sector resources to set up factories to work on distribution. And this has improved access of Aflasif. And by February of 2021, we had about 3,600 tons of Aflasif produced at the rate of 10 kgs per hectare, applied on over 360,000 hectares. 
and producing over 720,000 tons of aflatoxin safe food. So this clearly shows a genetic innovation and its use in the real situation of controlling aflatoxin. This would not have been possible without our partners across the different countries with the donor support that we've received and the team that has worked behind it. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And truly, congratulations on such a successful program and use of technology to manage such an, such an important issue in food safety. Truly impressive work. I want to just mention to everybody or remind to everybody that please use the Q&A for uh, asking questions. And as we said earlier in the uh, presentation or in the, uh, in the session, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. I'd next like to introduce Mr. Luca Benini, CEO of Hello Nature, who became a uh, leader of that company in 2001 and continues the legacy of the company's founding values of quality, passion, innovation, and respect for nature. Mr. Benini is a leader in the sector and Hello Nature is the world's largest producer of 100% vegetable-based biostimulants for use in agriculture. And in 2018, Luca was elected president of the European Biostimulant Industry Council and also serves on the board of Agrinovis Indiana. He will be talking about plant stimulants and foliar and soil amendments. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Luca Bonini and I am the CEO of Hello Nature, a company devoted to drive sustainability in agriculture by the use of new innovative solutions called biostimulants. The global change in the way of producing in agriculture that took place since 1950, known as the Green Revolution, has achieved great results, and we cannot deny that, having met the need for food of many people around the world, thanks mainly to two technical tools. First, the massive use of pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizer, and then the use of high yield varieties of plants. Just to give an example, Cereal production doubled between 1960 and the year 2000, but at a really huge cost. The development of an agriculture based on high energy and chemical inputs has produced multiple environmental damages, and unfortunately, and contributed at the end to what we define today as climate change. But, and here is the good news, Agriculture is also a huge part of the solution to climate change, as it has and it will have a central role in building a more sustainable future, and that by facing one huge challenge, satisfying the request of an ever-growing world population with less inputs and less soil available. The Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, estimates by the year 2050 we will need to produce at least 60% more food to feed a world population of over 9 billion people. Growing crops in sub-optimal conditions is continually facing extreme weather like drought, heat, uh, flooding, frost. The agricultural sector has no choice but to embark on a much greener revolution which means increase crop productivity and quality, applying sustainable practices and tools, and reducing the environmental footprint. We can increase sustainably crop production by using biologicals, or what we call biostimulants, which are a critical element for a greener agriculture, thanks to their ability to improve soil quality, increase nutrient efficiency, and plant tolerance to environmental stresses. But what are biostimulants? In December 2019, the United States, for the first time in the so-called Farm Bill, they introduced a definition of biostimulant. A biostimulant is a substance or a microorganism that, when applied to seeds, plants, or the rhizosphere, stimulates natural processes to enhance or benefit nutrient uptake, nutrient efficiency, tolerance to abiotic stress, or crop quality and yield. We can also define 
biostimulants by what they are not. They are different than traditional fertilizers. In fact, they do not deliver nutritional elements to the plants, although they often improve the assimilation of nutrients. They are not chemical plant growth regulators. They are not hormones. Yet some biosimilant substances have been shown to activate precursor of plant hormones and stimulate the production and gene expression. And at the end, they are neither pesticides or herbicides. Biostimulants are mentioned by the European Bioeconomy Alliance in the programmatic document The Crucial Role of the Bioeconomy in Achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a means of implementing overall and specifically goal number two, which is an angle. And we go back to our main topic. We need to produce more with less and we need to achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. Biostimulants can therefore contribute to the realization of a sustainable intensification of the plant production model that FAO itself promotes with the Sustainable Development Goals. Example of physiological functions that biostimulants can affect include such things as increasing root growth, biomass, increased uptake and translocation of nutrients inside the plant, activation of hormone signaling pathways and gene expression, protection of photosynthetic activity during stress, and even improving a plant rhizosphere which can provide a better environment for symbiotic relationship with beneficial uh, microbials that are present in the soil, sometimes already present without the addition of them. Stimulation of this physiological function result in the end in actual physical changes in plants, such as a better nutritional composition of plants, improvement of nutrient use competence, improved water use capability, and enhanced resistance to and recovery from abiotic stress, such as drought, salinity, and higher chlorophyll concentrations. It's proven that on average, farmers are able to harvest 50% of the yield potential of their crop. This yield gap can be caused by abiotic stress, which are diseases, and abiotic stress. But it's proven that the most negative impact is made by abiotic stress. In fact, abiotic stress like heat, cold, salinity, drought, and excess of water cause from 65 to 75 percent of this yield gap while biotic stress in diseases only between 25 and 35 percent. It has been scientifically proven that biostimulants are able to enhance the tolerance of plants and crops to abiotic stress and allow to achieve a higher level of yield in situations where the environmental conditions are not optimal at all, which will be more and more common in the future due to climate change and soil degradation all over the world. So this is a challenge we will need to face. Growers are continuously facing the need to balance the economics of the inputs they use and the output they are producing. The careful use of high quality, innovative biostimulants has shown to demonstrate the ability to overcome the cost of the use for many farmers through the improvement of the yield and the sustainability of the grower's land by reducing overall the needs of inputs and decreasing the nutrient leaching into the soil and thus polluting the soil. We are increasing the value of the crops with improving the fruit quality and extending the shelf life by biofortification. Biostimulants have a wide application efficacy and are generally beneficial for all growing plants, no matter if we are talking about grow crops, vegetables, fruit trees, or gardening. Depending on the type, they can be applied by foliar means, fertilization, in furrow, transplant, on roots, and on seeds. So a wide variety of applications. They are produced from a multitude of sources and different technologies. Humic and fulvic acids, for example, beneficial microbials like mycorrhiza, trichoderma, and PGPRs, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, protein hydrolysates, preferably from vegetal sources rather than animal, some of which contain amino acids, or even better, 
containing complete peptide chains that are like signaling peptides in the plant. Seaweeds, kelp, botanical, and the list can go on. And this, lean, this list will continue to grow as new products and technologies are developed by the industry and university. Biostimulants are an important tool to increase the economic profitability of growers in a sustainable way, which is essential for the future of agriculture if we want to continue to grow it. The continuous investment in research and development of biostimulant technology leads to the obtention of increasingly advanced and specific products, able to satisfy farmers, final consumers and environmental needs. Omics science will have a key role in the development of the sector and in understanding what physiological functions can be affected and how, as well as artificial intelligence and machine learning and even robotics are the future to identify new raw materials in a better, quicker, more efficient way. Last but not the least, authorities are working to clearly define this category of products and it is urgent to define a legal framework to regulate the sector on a global scale. If you are curious about biostimulants and you want to know more, I suggest that you visit www.biostimulant.com because biostimulants are the future of agriculture. Thank you, Luca. Thank you very much for that introduction and explanation of plant biostimulants. And thank you for Hello Nature's leadership in this area and the work that you've done both uh, in Europe and also support provided in the US as we've tried to establish a regulatory framework for these unique products. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Brooks Kutsia. He's the global biology leader at Corteva AgriScience and leads Corteva's nutrient management and biological portfolio. It's a very nice extension to Luca's presentation. Primary focus of Corteva's program is to characterize product program and production system solutions with special emphasis on empowering grower success, partnering with external innovation and a unified approach between biologicals and conventional solutions. Dr. Katsia, a Cortova laureate, has been actively involved in research and development across the globe for over three decades. Dr. Katsia, thank you very much. Greetings to everyone. My name is Brooks Kutsia. Today I have the privilege to discuss biologicals and integrated management systems. First off, I would like to thank the organizers, the USDA, Purdue University, and the Global Agricultural Innovation Forum for inviting me to have this discussion on biologicals. And to you all, a big thank you for attending. It is much appreciated. A little bit more about myself. I grew up in the Karoo region of South Africa, a semi-desert with about 300 millimeters of rain per year. The problem with averages are that they are flanked with by extremes. What I remember vividly growing up is not the lack of rain, because drought was a constant, but floods, soil erosion, and loss of fertile topsoil. That constant battle to preserve healthy fertile soil, ground cover, and to maintain productivity. I guess no one had to convince me about the importance of soil and production systems. It is in my DNA. Since those early days, I have seen and experienced the power of innovation and the sustainable prosperity that healthy soils and ecosystems can support. The road of higher education took me through the University of the Free State in South Africa, North Carolina State University, and the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. I've had the privilege to work and learn from most distinguished scientists and have had great mentors. I'm currently leading the global teams responsible for the characterization of potential products in Corteva's biologicals and nutrient management platforms. Throughout my career, the best, most novel and eloquent solutions were not silver bullets, transgenes or new molecules. It is using all the new innovations, insights and knowledge to optimize the total production system in a balanced and sustainable way. I'm passionate about incorporating and adopting technology that is scientifically proven and cannot overemphasize the interplay between a business scientist and traditional scientist. In the end, it's still science. The timelines may be different. And here is where the crux lies. 
let's address the white elephant in the room. The fact that many early adopters were not seeing the advantages from using biologicals. The snake oil label and that perception still persist. That is the challenge. Unscrupulous marketed products have overpromised results, misled customers about their effectiveness, and product performance was less consistent. The mode of action for some biologicals are complex, is not fully known or understood. This is no excuse. There are numerous, new innovative products and product concepts in biologicals in this space that needs to go forward. How do Corteva, and more importantly, we as an industry bring these new innovations to producers and consumers? I would argue that now, more than ever, a transparent, science-based approach is critical. Nothing substitutes for a robust field testing program. It needs to be over time and space to be confident that you can make a claim regarding the performance of the product. We need to move beyond the promise seven bushel breaker pump that every biostimulant out there has. Corteva is fully committed to test and evaluate all biological products with the same scientific rigor as with traditional crop protection products to confirm their modes of action, reliability, safety, and efficacy. Innovation is driven by consumer demands, safety, quality, sustainability, customer demands, efficacious, reliable, easy to use and sustainable, and is shaped by regulations. Let's think about the Green Deal in Europe. From the onset, science-based biological products are complementary to existing economic production practices and crop protection solutions. It's an indispensable tool to manage resistance, introduce new modes of action, and allowing farmers to be more sustainable and productive. Where does innovation come from? It's a fair question. It is everywhere. I'm privileged to interact with researchers from all over the world, and the technology is not only in the domain of the big blue chips, pure play biological companies, multinationals, but it's literally everywhere. Universities, startups, small specialized technology firms, and all of the supporting sciences. Can we address the complexity and the mode of action conundrum in biostimulants? It is both a challenge and an opportunity, and we at Corteva wants to be part of the solution. Today, biostimulants are defined by what they are. We postulate it should rather be what they do. And to do that, we are segmenting them into classes based on their mode of action. So for biostimulants, we have nutrition deficiency, metabolic drivers, and abiotic stresses. The nutrition efficiency piece, nitrogen, phosphorus, and I refer a little bit to the Utrecht in story later in this presentation, is an idea that we can improve water quality, get some sustainability uh, benefits, and in overall improve our use of plant nutrition in our production systems. Metabolic drivers, do just what they say they do. They drive the met metabolism of plants. And then abiotic stresses. Water is the biggest one. Is the transient variability that comes with the weather-dependent production system. The question is, what can farmers do? What, if anything, can they add to their system to better manage risk? Earlier this month, we had an internal data review of a rather elaborate biocontrol study. And one of the key questions we asked was, in essence, we were curious on how did products change, biological products, over the last 20 years? Part of the study is a straightforward era study. It included products on different time frames. We had experimental commercials and conventional products, and we measured the percentage of disease control in a high value speciality crop. Included in here, with these products from different eras. We had a recent introduction of a biological product the last five to seven years when it was put on the market. We had a new introduction of a biological crop uh, later this year, maybe early next year it will be introduced. And then a commercial standard biological as 10 to 15 year old borehors that's out there and uh, has been earning its keep for the last 15 years. In the process, it became clear that the progress in technology is stunning. These were new modes of action. We had improved efficacy. 
better consistency in performance, stability, shelf life, lower doses, more cost efficient, safer, etc., etc. Overall, it became clear that the idea of having a program approach where you combine conventional and biological products makes a lot of sense. And MRL management, being able to actively manage what your residue limits would be in, in this high value crop is uh, something that now can be added to a producer's production system. So what about the future? I see biologicals coming to the forefront as a truly preventative tool. It becomes a part of the integrated precision ag production system, a combination of conventional biologicals and complementary uh, management practices, a dynamic data-driven management decision matrix. It is the old and trusted integrated pest management system we just have a lot of focus now on precision and prevention. Let's talk a little bit about the idea of sustainable nitrogen. This is a bit of an oxymoron. Nitrogen is perceived as one of the bigger agricultural pollutants. Used precision agriculture, optimized nitrogen, nitrogen rates, but now we also consider the total production system. How about we combine this nitrogen rate with uh, Optinite technology, a proven conventional nitrogen stabilizer with a known mode of action, it's bacteriostatic and nitrous monas bacteria in the soil, and that keeps nitrogen longer in the root zone. Now you add a nitrogen fixating microbe to respond to the temporal crop needs. Currently, the most effective way a farmer has to manage inherent field variability and the risk associated with insufficient nitrogen is to over-fertilize or fertilize at a higher rate. By adding this nitrogen fixating microbe, we now have deployed a mechanism to offset this variability and allow farmers to use less nitrogen or more precise nitrogen rates. This is a unified system approach to minimize volatilization of greenhouse gases and leaching of nitrates into groundwater, a win-win for productivity and the environment. Less nitrogen, more productivity. Mainstreaming synthetic biology, driven by our increased understanding of genomes of pests, plants, and organisms. That seems like a far-fetched idea, but just think. Think of DNA as algorithms, of GATCs redesigned and more targeted. And then on top of that, you add artificial intelligence, all of those iterations, combinations, and solution decisions that was not considered before. That is where mainstream synthetic biology with artificial intelligence is a new frontier that's going to be breached pretty soon. If we consider that 99% of microbes can be cultured in the lab, then tools to cultivate microbes that's no, no, not available right now is a no-brainer. Two microbiologists, Lewis and Epstein, have developed a device that enables scientists to separate and incubate single strains of bacteria in their natural environment. Rather than in a Petri dish, this thumb-sized device that captures single microbial cells and sustains them through exposure to nutrient-rich soil is the new frontier. Just think about it. 99% of microbes that could not be cultured in the lab before is now open for exploration. I would think that all of you agree with me. The future is bright for biologicals. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brooks. That was a great presentation. It really makes you realize just the, uh, the breadth of products that are in development, the opportunities that exist, and quite frankly, the importance of really applying good science and uh, technology experimental methods to really be able to justify or demonstrate the benefits these products really do provide. And I would agree with you, the future isn't bright indeed. So thank you for that. I'd like now to introduce Mr. Rick Melnick. Rick is the Vice President of Global Business at Dunham Trimmer. Rick has 25 years of experience in agriculture, marketing, communications, and business management. 
He serves as outgoing chairman of the board of directors of the Biological Products Industry Alliance and is the former president of Bioprotection Global, the global association of biocontrol and trade associations. And one last time prior to the talk, could you please remember to use the Q&A to be able to ask questions? Thank you again, Rick. Well, thank you, Terry. It's good to see you again. And we really appreciate the opportunity for Dunham Trimmer to participate today. So we've been asked to talk to you today about the biologicals industry from a marketing perspective, particularly innovations from the private sector. So first, I just thought I would introduce you to Dunham Trimmer, who we are. We're a relatively small team of four professionals. We've all been involved in the biologicals industry, biocontrols, biopesticides, biostimulants for at least 20 years. We've all served on board positions or committee chair positions with the major trade associations, including BPIA, uh, some with IBMA. I was also a president of Bioprotection Global, which is the Association of Biologicals Associations. So our client list is uh, extensive in this area. And again, we're, we're thankful to participate. The whole team here participated in putting this presentation together. So let's go ahead and get started. I think it's a good thing to start with, you know, what, what is the industry that we're talking about? What's the size of the industry? What does the growth look like? We're at about a $7 billion market right now between the three segments of biocontrols. And that's gonna go up to, we forecast around 17 billion in 2027. We have double digit CAGR in all segments of biocontrol. So that's a, a really good sign. What are the drivers behind that? Both markets are experiencing external forces that are favoring adoption, particularly policy uh, changes around the world. Biocontrols benefit from consumers demanding high quality produce, reduced residues, sustainable production. Growers are also uh, keenly in, interested in resistance management benefits. On the biostimulant side, same thing on consumer demand. Growers, uh, consumers want high quality produce. They also want year round production. They want to be able to buy whatever they want, whenever they want. And growers are interested in abiotic stress mitigation and biostimulants uh, perform very well in that area. When we talk about marketing biologicals, which is what my presentation is on, marketing is about establishing benefits and then selling that value proposition to your customers. And so what are the attributes that we associate with biologicals? We have efficacy, enhanced crop quality, I'll get into details on these a little bit later, uh, enhanced yield, residue management, labor and harvest benefits, soft on beneficials, resistance management, environmental safety, IPM compatibility. A lot of these are self-evident, but I'll, I'll provide a little bit uh, deeper look into those as we go. Now, typically the presentations that we do uh, we're talking about commercial, a little bit unique. This is a different audience. And so we're not just going to be talking about growers that are selling their, their crop, but also growers that are growing their crop uh, as subsistence farmers, just, just to live for their families. So we're going to look at each of these benefits and how much value these different farmers place on those benefits. So efficacy for a commercial grower, efficacy is king. If the product doesn't work, it doesn't have any value. They have a lot of choices. Crop quality, a commercial grower might be selling apples based on size or grapes on uh, taste or color, all these things translate into a higher value for their crop and a higher return on investment. So that's certainly important for them. Enhanced yield can mean volume of yield, but it can also mean, uh, you know, relating to crop quality, the grade, uh, the size of the produce. So biologicals uh, play in this area for sure and growers find a lot of value in that. Residue management, this is really important for an export grower. So commercial farmers, we're talking about exporters, domestic sales, we're talking about row crop growers, uh, fresh produce growers, organic growers. We don't have time to go through all the permutations on this particular presentation. So this is kind of a catch all. These are the values that we've assigned for this presentation. But this one in particular for, for growers that are selling internationally, this is a huge benefit. They can't have their crop stuck at a port and getting rejected and lose their entire investment. Uh, residue management is a huge benefit for them. Labor management, labor is their most expensive input. 
Uh, this is certainly important. Get people back into the field, short REI, uh, get, uh, be able to make a late season application and then harvest a PHI. Also harvest timing, hitting key marketing windows because you can stagger the timing of your, of your harvest. Those are all very important to a commercial grower and, and biologicals play well there. Soft on beneficials, eh, I don't know that they care so much about that. They, they want solutions that work if they're soft and beneficial is great. Resistance management, some growers will get a new product and, and burn it out, use it uh, until it doesn't work on it anymore. Other growers are very thoughtful about rotating chemistry. So that kind of depends on the grower. All growers are, they're the ultimate stewards of the land. They depend on their land for, for their income. So I think environmental safety is uh, very important for all growers. IPM compatibility, some growers care, some growers don't. I think IPM is kind of the way of doing business these days, but uh, not everybody's so concerned about that. Quite different though, when we go to a small holding farm. Efficacy is certainly important. Uh, they, they need products that work too. Crop quality, uh, not so much. They don't care about a misshapen potato or a tomato with spots or some rust on an apple. They're growing food for their families. They're not trying to sell it. So those aesthetic uh, qualities don't matter to them so much. They want yield, uh, they want better yield, but again, they don't want those, they don't care about those aspects of yield, like a higher grade uh, uh, apple or something like that. So we gave that a, a middle value. Residue management, they're, they're not worried about that. They're not selling to export markets as long as they're following the label. Their labor tends to be the family. So again, um, REI, PHI, not that important. As long as they follow the label, they're, they're comfortable with the safety aspects. Beneficials, you know, they don't have that many choices. So they're not necessarily trying to maintain their beneficials populations. They just, they have uh, limited cash and limited things that they can work with. That's not their priority. Resistance management, same thing. They're, they're gonna have a lot of cash. They're not rotating. They, they're gonna use what they can uh, and move on. Environmental safety, you know, they're, they're very important to any grower, small holding or commercial. IPM compatibility here, uh, I think this is more of a cost-driven uh, IPM concern. They're, if they can use cultural practices to reduce inputs and spend less money on inputs, that's their, uh, that's their driver for using IPM on the small holding side. So what can we learn from this market information and these, uh, this attribute assessment? What we know is the biologicals market is very strong. It's strong and it's growing. We saw that from the graph. Consumer demand and policy changes are really what's behind it, and mainly in the high value crop area. The growth of the market that we saw would suggest that biologicals companies are doing a great job of marketing those benefits and that growers see a return on investment for using biologicals. Making it mandatory to switch from chemical use to biological use is not gonna hurt the market. Row crop growers are not as closely linked to consumer demand. So some of those consumer demand attributes are not as important to them. They're more driven by increased yield. So where there are opportunities to use biologics for yield increase, they will certainly do it. Uh, on the input side, there is a movement to reduce fertilizer inputs. And so they are adopting biostimulants to account for that change. And they do see an ROI on that. We are forecasting an increase in the row crop market from about a billion dollars uh, last year to almost four and a half billion dollars in 2030. And one of the reasons for that growth relates to the pheromones market. So there has been some disruptive technology in the pheromones market where synthetic biology, the use of yeasts to manufacture AIs in, this, in the pheromone space has brought costs way down. That is going to allow more companies into this space and is going to make the technology more available uh, to a wider range of growers, including small holdings growers, because the technical demands of using a pheromone are not quite as high. Adoption among small holding farmers is still lagging behind. And that's because these growers are not driven by consumer demand. They're growing food for their families. Biologicals can be expensive and the technical demands can be high. And so they are certainly behind the curve. On the other side of that equation, biologicals producers are not highly motivated to devote resources to developing these markets. 
it does take technical resources to train people how to use these products, how to realize the benefits. And as you might imagine, biologicals manufacturers are focused on that commercial side of the 80-20. So how do we reach these smallholding farmers? How do we get to this untapped market? The public sector has a high interest in that, but the private, the private sector has low interest in that. And the way that we bridge that is gonna be public and private partnerships. There are great examples in the public health space of how public and private partnerships have helped biologicals to thrive. You probably know the story about gift, uh, Merck gifting ivermectin to the world for onchocerciasis control. There's also malaria intervention partnerships that exist. So I think agriculture could learn a lot from what has happened in public health. CABI is an IGO that was established by the United Nations specifically for that purpose. You may or may not be familiar with CABI. You can find it at cabi.org, but that's really what they do. They help to facilitate public and private partnerships for developing companies to raise awareness and adoption of biologicals. They have a searchable database called Bioprotection, the Bioprotection Portal. There are some private donor companies behind that. Trade associations, the, uh, the biological trade associations around the world are, are strong supporters of CABI and what they're doing. CABI also has a deep understanding of the cultural barriers and opportunities in these markets. Uh, these growers tend to be very community driven. You, you could see that in the public health and onchocerciasis efforts. Once you can get the, the village or the people in the village involved in decision-making, in distribution, in some cases with CABI, they now even have some uh, manufacturing partnerships that they've developed. Uh, and that's when they really will, will pay attention to you and, and adopt the solution. CABI's focused on economically sustainable solutions. So you might reach out to them and say, hey, we wanna give something back. Here's $50 million to buy biocontrols for these folks. Um, they won't turn you down, but they're more interested in solutions. You know, they could spend that $50 million and then it's gonna be gone. They're more, uh, they're more interested in building long-term solutions that has the community involved uh, in, a, in a sustainable future. If you are a company that's interested in this market, it's gonna take significant resources. So by that, I mean, it's gonna require a philosophical commitment from senior leadership at the company. Um, it's, there are plenty of long-term PR benefits to be gained. However, if you're involved with the UN, WHO, FAO, uh, you're going to get some visibility and your brand can certainly gain some PR benefits if you decide that you want to lead in that area. So thank you so much again for the opportunity. You can reach me at rick at dunhamtrimmer.com and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great, Rick. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for taking the time. <clears throat> it's, uh, it is a complicated business and there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of the advice that you provided, I think it can be very well received by those who are interested in getting involved in this particular industry. So for now, we're in the Q&A session. And again, I'd like to encourage you to include your questions in, uh, in the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. So I'm going to start with general and then start moving to a little bit more specific. So maybe as one just to kick off is this. <laughs> Several speakers talked about the agricultural system. And maybe for each one of the panelists, perhaps starting with Luca, how do biostimulants fit within traditional agricultural systems? In other words, should they be viewed as an addition to traditional systems? Or do we need to design a whole new paradigm? Hi, Terry, and thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think that biostimulants uh, are not alternative to uh, fertilizers or pesticides, herbicides, and other products. Biostimulants uh, complement uh, the program that a farmer should use uh, in order to get the best result you could achieve. So when we are thinking about uh, uh, stresses like abiotic stress, uh, drought, uh, salinity, and so on, the application of biostimulant can help to reduce the gap between what we normally achieve and the potential uh, growth that we can have in the crop. So uh, at the very end, farmers really need to 
understand it. We as an industry, we, we need to teach them that biostimulants are an important tool today to improve their productivity, to improve sustainability of the crop uh, by applying them together with, uh, with other, other products. So they are really not uh, alternative, but as I said, complementary to that. Thanks, Luca. Uh, Jane or Brooks, would you like to comment on this? The main thing about a systems approach is that we realize the complexity of what we're dealing with. And we're looking for a solution every way, optimizing and tweaking every part of it and not relying or over rely on highly efficacious uh, innovations in molecular, conventional crop protection, fertilizers, et cetera. It is actually paying attention to those those small details and small nuances that you can make a big difference. That's one part of the, the, the part of a system. The second part of the system, and it, it struck me uh, really hard uh, when, when we just, the, the previous speaker discussed it, is the socioeconomic part of the system that we need to understand. What motivates different people to adopt different technologies? And we shouldn't shouldn't forget that because the once again it's adding something to a tried and trusted system is what will will uh, drive that decision. Thanks, Brooks. Jane, care to comment? Yes, just a brief comment on the fact that um, at the end of the day we need to look at what enhances what uh, we are already doing. And um, how can we optimize on the resources that are being applied? And so I see biostimulants playing a, a critical role in optimizing on the resources that um, the producers are already using. And so it's getting the word out there, getting people to understand what they are. Because the minute, especially uh, with limited knowledge, the word bio appears on anything, it sends other connotations. So I think there's a lot of need to educate the masses, the smallholder farmer, um, and the consumers worldwide on what this means and the part they play in enhancing what has been applied. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. Let me ask you a more specific question about your product, uh, Afla Safe. Uh, Jane, what do you see as the barriers to widespread adoption of Afla Safe? And maybe as a follow on to that, what is the longevity of AFLA-SAFE's benefits and is reapplication necessary? So barriers, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Terry. And uh, very, very um, great questions there. afla -Safe, what are the barriers to the adoption of afla -Safe? I'd like to step back and ask how many of us and when in, did we hear about aflatoxins? And um, the one major challenge to the adoption of aflasif is the appreciation of the challenge aflatoxin. And the main reason for that is because aflatoxins are not visible to the naked eye. You cannot taste them, neither can you smell them. It takes a proper lab test to analyze a crop and know whether we have a significant amount of aflatoxins or not. And so because the, the challenge is hidden in a way, then the majority of our consumers, producers do not appreciate that we have a challenge. The other thing that limits the adoption of AFLASAFE is the fact that for you then now to analyze a crop sample to know whether it's contaminated or not, you need a lab test. Access to testing services, the cost of testing services, is significantly higher. And especially the issue of access, you go to a lot of markets, the nearest testing facility is so far away from them, yet a buyer needs to make a buying decision. So the minute that you cannot test spontaneously, and then coupled with low awareness of the challenge of aflatoxin, then solutions as aflasif are are not widely used because the, the people that we target, especially the producers, smallholder farmers, commercial farmers, any farmer out there who, who is supposed to use aflasif, apply it on their crop as it grows in the field, then 
um, you realize that if the information has not tricked them, they're not aware, they're not likely to use Aflasif. And this uh, relates to what uh, Rick just spoke to the last presenter on the cost of creating awareness on these solutions. We need a lot of awareness raising, people to be able to appreciate the challenge of aflatoxin and then get to know of the solutions like Aflasif and how to use it properly to be able to benefit. And that cost of awareness raising, especially when you're dealing with masses um, of smallholder farmers in Africa, for example, is a significant cost. And that's why we're calling for collaborations of different parties, uh, private sector companies, leveraging resources of development sector to create that knowledge that is required to stimulate uptake of solutions as Aflasif. And there are many other re reasons that I can go into later. The question on the longevity of Aflasif. Once a farmer applies Aflasif on their fields, it's applied once in a growing season. So what happens is that, that the protection is within that season. But remember, these are natural products. So there's some, we've seen from research that we've been carrying on, these are a remnant residue of the, of the atoxygenic strains still in the field in subsequent seasons. But is it adequate to protect the crop from exposure to aflatoxin? Maybe yes, maybe no. These are areas of subject uh, that are still undergoing a lot of research. And for now, what we recommend is the farmer should apply Aflasif every crop season. And how then do we encourage the farmer to do this? Is by keeping the cost of Aflasif significantly lower. What IITA has done in this space is entered into partnerships with private sector companies that produce Aflasif. And we engage with them to understand what is their motivation for taking in Aflasif and how and their strategy for placing it out there in the marketplace so that it is as affordable as possible and we can encourage mass usage by the farmers. And this is the one strategy to keep the cost down. So we are highly engaged with the commercial manufacturers and distributors of Aflasif to ensure that the price is affordable and makes commercial sense, and that stimulates the usage of Aflasif so that you have you encourage farmers to use it season in, season, uh, uh, season after season. Uh, a lot of research going on will further be able to inform us on uh, whether there is need to skip a season or do a, a certain variation in subsequent seasons. But for now, what we know is use it uh, on every other season. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Very well said. Let me ask you one more question as a, as a follow-up that came in. Is uh, can Aflasafe or can that technology be used to uh, control other fungi disease producing toxins? For example, fusarium and cereals. Uh, so can the technology or can the experience with Aflasafe be extended to other fungi producing toxins? Uh, thank you, Terry. Aflasif, the main active ingredient is the non-toxin producing aspergillus. And so it's specifically made for the aspergillus fungi. And so it may not be used for fusarium or anything else. It's specifically for aspergillus and um, mainly because this is also the most commonly occurring toxin of the aflatoxins. Thank you. Jane, maybe just, just to follow, can the, can the technology or the, the approach used to identify aspergillus strains that are not producing uh, aflatoxin, can that approach be used for other fungi producing uh, toxins? Um, in terms of using the technology or the genetic, the, the, the innovation around Aflase for other um, toxins, um, that may not be probably possible because of the nature of those toxins. And um, it may be, it may not be, but I think it's just a subject of research, but uh, the nature of the toxin will determine whether that technology can be applied. Great, thank you very much for explaining further. All right, here's another general question. And uh, 
let's uh, gonna, again, would like to start with Luca since it pertains to biostimulants and then perhaps go to Brooks and Jane is how can we make biostimulants more available to small family farmers who have made, who may have limited capital for expensive inputs? <laughs> that is a great question. Thanks, Terry. And I think there's a question that uh, uh, the industry is still uh, working on uh, how to solve uh, in, in countries like United States or in Europe where distribution is well organized. It's not very difficult to get a product, even if uh, even there small farmers sometimes have difficulties uh, in finding uh, uh, the availability of of, uh, of biostimulants. Now, if we are talking about uh, uh, poorer countries where distribution is not organized, then here is the challenge, both for, um, for the industry to make a biostimulant uh, knowledgeable for the farmers. So here sometimes is the first challenge that, uh, that we have. How can we go over the doubts uh, and uh, how can we teach better uh, to smaller farmers on how to use uh, uh, biostimulants? Sometimes these are technologies they, they don't know or they consider as, as snake oil products. Uh, from an economic perspective, that's sure that the industry will have to work and make uh, these technologies uh, more, uh, more available. As Jane said, uh, uh, keeping prices low, keeping uh, uh, technologies uh, really uh, easy to use for the farmers. So I think that uh, economically and technically, the industry has to do a lot of work to make these products available for, for smaller farmers. And we will need to play a major role in uh, also teaching and, and being present uh, in, in the countries where biostimulants are, uh, are needed. Uh, if I can connect to the presentation I made, uh, we said that biostimulants are, are mostly uh, used and mostly uh, um, needed when we are working in suboptimal conditions. And many, many times this is what is happening in poorer countries. I'm thinking about Africa, Asia, Southern America, and so on. Also in some parts of, of clearly Europe and United States. But if we focus on soil degradation and uh, desertification, that's clear that biostimulants can play a major role in helping mitigate uh, these, uh, these problems. Now, how we get there, that is the challenge of, of the industry. And also, of, if I can say, of the governments that we need to approve the products in these countries. Thanks, Luca. Uh, Brooks, care to comment on that? Yes. And uh, actually, I, I would say the best way to answer that question is to, to say it depends. <laughs> it, it, it really depends on what you want to address when you go to a different set of circumstances. Let's take the example of distribution. Um, when, when you look at a, a biostimulant that makes phosphorus more available in the soil, you probably are helping the distribution piece because one for one, adding a, a phosphatase enzyme to your uh, planting action, you're making much more soil available uh, phosphorus or uh, soil phosphorus available to the plants, which which addresses one of one of the challenges is that distribution channel. So. Getting back to it depends also as uh, innovation is addressing a lot of that as we speak. Uh, higher concentrations, higher quality, greater efficacy, better shelf lives, better cost positioning. That is, that's that impetus forward, that wave of innovation that's coming to the forefront. That's addressing those and making it more accessible. As to cost, um, supply and demand, I'm a great believer in that. That will drive the, the cost equation. And not all technologies will be available everywhere all the time, but when there's a demand for it, there will be a way to to make make that value that value proposition real to the to the farmer. Doesn't matter where he is on the globe and what his limitations are. Thanks very much, Brooks. And Jane, care to comment on that as well? Um, for that, too, it depends. 
Um, I think what I would also add is the fact that um, I see a role of government and development uh, partners in terms of improving access, especially to these. These are new solutions that smallholder farmers aren't aware of, especially here in Africa. I mean, we're still struggling with fertilizer so many hundreds of years on. So the awareness plus uh, encouraging trial through demonstrations, number one, and through sampling, and um, even um, working on input subsidy programs to promote access, especially to biologicals that are uh, of significant benefit to the food production systems in a given uh, space. So I see the role of also other partners together with the role of the producers of these technologies in terms of stimulating uptake, especially for the masses. And then that's with time creates demand that makes business sense for business companies to be able to in, in invest in, uh, in scaling out such technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And let me, here's another question. And this time, let me start with uh, Brooks. A um, number of speakers talked about management of residues and crops and animal products. It seems this is a challenge when marketing to different markets with different requirements. How do biologicals help address these issues? So the, that, the issue is multidimensional. First off, you have the regulatory con constraints that's put on top and that's foremost, it's safety and what that residue mean and what it is. Then you have a consumer uh, driven part where um, residues are seen as bad and uh, you have your, your big uh, supermarket groups and distributors trying to actively manage that as part of a service and a value capture for their, for their customers. But then also there is this, um, I, would, I would argue this, this link between uh, MRLs and sustainability and off-target move. And so we have this, this inherent link that that's true or not, doesn't matter. It's perception and perception is reality between MRLs and sustainability. So stepping back is what can biologicals do to actively manage that or actively address that? The first part is let's look at worker safety. And that's a safety book piece is that if you have to be in the field closer to uh, harvest time, what you apply to preserve quality, quantity, and that, uh, uh, all of the aspects that adds value, you can use a biological instead of hardcore chemistry with known uh, uh, safety concerns to address that. that. That's one part. The second part of what it can do or cannot do in terms of MRL management is programs where Either you want to reduce, to preserve registration, reduce the amount of conventional chemistry being used uh, and put that in orchestration now with the biological and manage the, the overall uh, amount that's being put out on the field. Timing of when you put it out, and what you put in the meantime, that's another way of, of what biologicals uh, contribute. So in short is that the avenues that the biological can use or that where biologicals are used to address MRLs are multi, multifaceted, multidimensional. But in all of those, safety is a big part. You have to be sure that you address safety not only for the conventional chemistry, but for your biologicals. And you address uh, uh, efficacy and you address that return on investment for the, for the grower. All three of those when you when you go at MRL management. To me, the biggest challenge right now is to make sure that when we when we address MRLs, MRL management, we're really addressing the MRLs on the final crop that's getting to the to the to the supermarket and getting to the table, doesn't matter how. And we're not trying to address everything that has to do with sustainability under the banner of MRLs, because it's easy, easy to confuse the two, the one driving the other. Thanks, Brooks. Very insightful. Thank you. Uh, Jane, would you care to comment on this? Uh, seems to relate very closely to, uh, to Safe as well. 
Yes, and I think in this time, I begin with, it depends on what um, residues you're talking about. Um, I think there's need to always quantify when we talk about uh, residues. Are they good or are they not so good? Um, in the case of Aflasif, thinking as a farmer, the more residues I have of the good toxin, uh, the, the, the good uh, fungi, there's uh, the non-toxin producing aspergillus I have sitting on my farm, the better on, on, on the produce. Actually, we've seen aflas, if uh, studies have shown that uh, the protection is uh, has been ex uh, extends to storage. So by defining what residues we are talking about, then uh, it helps us take the proper direction in terms of the answer. But in the event of especially chemical residues, I think, yes, biologicals are a good answer. And like, um, especially with regard to exposure for the environment, um, vital insects. I mean, we are, we are in an era where we are talking about bees now. Um, bees were, are and still remain critical for pollination, but we, we, we don't quite see enough of them. And uh, that has been attributed to the impacts of um, uh, chemicals that have been used, especially in agriculture. So, Biologicals are a good answer in terms of solving some of the problems that we have out as we grow out crops. Uh, however, again, we need to scale up their use. It's a question of who is speaking loudest. Who is the farmer hearing? Remember, it's been years of using other solutions. How do we create a paradigm shift to more safer solutions? For example, the biologicals. How do we prove their efficacy that they work? How then do we improve access and deepen their reach? Today, it's easier to walk the local agro dealer and get agrochemical X and fertilizer B, but we like find a suitable, similar biological solution there. So it's working the whole system and um, it's a concerted effort of all parties. In uh, some of the countries where we work in, for example, in Burkina Faso, we've seen our partner there bundle up several solutions together that work in a similar mechanism so that he improves the access of those already known and the utilization of those not known by, uh, by riding, bundling them up with solutions that, that, that work. So yes, they're important. And I see them solving the challenge of residues, but the question of which res residues do we want to reduce and how do we get the word out there at a significant scale to cause impact? Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Jane. It's so funny as a regulatory guy, uh, whenever, whenever asked a question, regulator, regulatory person typically says it depends. And it's interesting how you both started your answers with, well, it depends, but it is a complicated issue. It's not very straightforward. So thank you very much for that further explanation. I'd like to uh, ask another question. This time, uh, let's get uh, Rick involved in the conversation. And uh, Rick, uh, in some sectors, biologicals are viewed as snake oil. And we kind of heard that in some of the presentations. What do you think can be done to encourage more mainstream adoption of biological amendments? And after we hear from Rick, I'd like to pose that also to Luca and, and Brooks and Jane, if we have, if we have time. Thank you. Terry, I think it does come down to efficacy. Uh, the, the biocontrols section has continued to grow dramatically. I think the, the snake oil perception has largely gone away. It's, it's quite different than it was maybe 15 years ago when the, the, the real snake oils, I guess, of the, the 90s, early 2000s were still fresh in people's memories. But over time, you know, the market has weeded those those products out, no pun intended. And uh, so I think the biostimulants now are, are in a very similar place. And so uh, that efficacy data is, is quite important. But when you're talking about abiotic stress, uh, you know, it's different, it's difficult to replicate trials when the environment is creating the uh, conditions under which your products perform very well. So people naturally are, you know, still learning about how these products work, what benefits they can derive, how profitable their use is. And so, uh, you know, I, I think we just need to continue to generate strong data and we can need to uh, not make claims that we can't substantiate. 
but I, I think that all, all indicators are that we're going in the right direction. Great, Rick. Thank you very much. Luca, from your perspective, what would you, what, how would you answer that question? Three words, um, science, science, science. We need to, to provide to, to the farmers and to distribution, uh, to the consumers, the fact that uh, we as industry, we have developed biostimulants because they work, because they are consistent and because they are efficient. So we need to provide all the data and uh, do not be afraid to, be, uh, to discuss about our products. We need to create the science behind. We need to understand how the products behave in different conditions. <clears throat> Obviously, they will not uh, work uh, the same uh, way uh, all the times. So we know that already, uh, but we need consistency in what we need. And we need to understand the mode of action of our products. And as, as a company, as I nature, we really work hard during the last 10 years to understand how our products uh, work and why they work in this way. Because if we know our products, then we can better teach to the farmers, to distribution, when is the best moment to apply, when they need to apply, and when they should not apply our products. Because in the perfect world where everything is optimum, well, basically they don't need biostimulants. So biostimulants are needed when there is an issue, when there is a suboptimal condition. But we know that uh, only if we continue to develop uh, the science behind our products. That's for me the, the most important topic uh, of all. Great. Thank you very much, Luca. I would certainly have to agree with that. And uh, let's get Brooks in. Brooks, what, what would be your take on this? I have nothing to add to the three words uh, that uh, Luca used. To me, it's very clear that we need to get it grounded in science, making sure that our claims are real. To me, the bigger sin is not making the claim. The bigger sin is overstating the claim. If you are confident in your product, then be confident in telling whoever is going to use it that this is what it will do. It can give you from nothing to this. Don't use your claim as marketing material and overstating what you will what you will deliver in the end. To me, that's as simple as that. Just uh, be realistic and uh, as close to, 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 to the real repeatable um, value of what your claim will be. Thanks, Brooks. And Jane, would you care to comment on that as well? Certainly, thank you. And uh, in addition to what uh, the earlier speakers have said, one of the uh, lessons we take on Aflasafe is um, involve, involve, involve the others. Involve as researchers, involving uh, the farmers, involving the partners we want for scaling up as we develop the products. Aflasafe trials are done on farmers' fields. We walk with them into the fields. We test the product with them. We do the analysis together, and they are able to see the results. And this has been very useful in terms of demystifying the science, and especially because it's a biocontrol product. So involve them. This has also further shortened the uptake curve. Actually, in, in the countries we are da we've done of late, because of that lesson of involve them, you know, we're not always going back to try once they come on board. We've involved them through the whole process, including the regulators. It has really uh, demystified the product, shortened the cup, uh, the cup for adoption, and made it um, uh, acceptable by the target audience. So involve them, and then forging partnerships. As a research institution, IATA, we do not have the resources to scale out these technologies. And a lot of uh, biological amendments, uh, solutions are sitting in research laboratories, not scaled out. We appreciate we don't have the expertise. We appreciate we don't have the resources. So we partner, especially with the private sector, to scale out these technologies and keep improving them from the feedback that we receive. So that's what I dare add to that. Thank you. Very well said. Very well said. Thank you. 
And I think we have time for perhaps one more question. And being the regulatory guy on this panel, if you don't mind, I'm going to try to give that first answer. The question is, since biostimulants are neither fertilizers, PGRs, or pesticides, how are they currently regulated and commercialized in the U.S.? Especially since there's no agreed upon definition of biostimulant within the U.S. government. And what about other countries? From the U.S. perspective, at least, right now, these products are typically regulated under fertilizer regulations, which are instituted at the individual state level. Fertilizers are essentially excluded under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, which is the U.S. pesticide legislation. And they are excluded uh, as uh, plant growth regulators. Even though they impact the physiology of the plant, they are really intended strictly for plant health. So as a consequence, they're regulated at the states, just how they regulate all other fertilizers, which causes some challenges because each of the states have, have their own, uh, have their own uh, fertilizer laws that need to be implemented. One of the things the industry is really striving to do is first get a, get a recognized definition for a biostimulant. By being able to have that definition, we can then be able to say what they are and what they are not from a regulatory perspective, and then to be developed, then to develop a framework to really encompass them, whether it be at the state level or even potentially at the federal level. So I think we are just about out of time and want to make sure that everybody, first of all, first of all, thanks so much to all the presenters for the time to be able to do their recordings, develop their presentations, et cetera. Very much appreciate your participation and thoughtful answers to many of these questions. The recording itself is available at the Global Ag Innovation Forum website, and it should be up in about 24 to 48 hours. If you have additional questions, uh, perhaps there may be an opportunity to answer them through the website or through uh, other opportunity or through directly uh, to the speakers themselves. So with that, I think we are about done. There's an announcement of the next, uh, next session that should be coming up very shortly. And here we are. The next session is on June 8th, a week from today, expanding access to breeding products. And the moderator will be Jennifer Billings, Global Agricultural Development Leader for Corteva AgriScience. And with that, I want to thank everybody again for their for listening in, for their participation, and hopefully you will continue to participate in the Global Ag Innovation Forum webinars. Have a great day. Bye-bye.